Hi guys, Sage is here. So this is the bonus video. And here we're going to be covering a little bit of trivia and a bit of the epilogue as well from all those files that we got at the end of the game. So if you are just tuning in, be aware that this video will have a lot of spoilers. And if you haven't finished the game or finished the Let's Play, please go and do that right now. Otherwise, well, I'm you're going to spoil yourself pretty hard. So let's start off with a bit of trivia and we'll see what happens. Alrighty, well, first up on the trivia, shopping block is Delta. <laughs> right into spoiler territories, but he's probably the biggest enigma within the game, hands down. Uh, <laughs> you may know him as that baby you knew for like several minutes, or that old man you briefly met for several minutes and then proceeded to have to deal with him as you found out. He is actually Q, and I don't mean this Q, I mean this Q. It's, it's, it's kind of confusing. Uh, <laughs> so, first off and foremost, we find out towards the end of the game that Q is not actually Sean, the robot child, but actually a tenth participant throughout most of the game, and he was an active participant pretending to be a blind and deaf man, <sighs> which is honestly quite confusing. And for the most part, you're not really told about him. He just kind of shows up. And when that happens, well, admittedly, everyone's kind of confused. Not everyone was happy with how that reveal came about, but there's a lot of foreshadowing that Delta, or Q, the 10th participant, is actually in the game, and a lot of it is very, very strange. So let's take a look at that, shall we? One thing to make note of right away is that the perspective for Zero Time Dilemma is quite skewed in how it works. A lot of it is actually through Delta and Q's perspective, mostly because he's reviewing security footage as well as actively participating on Q's part, you know, Q team. So when you think about it, wouldn't he be seen at least somewhat when you go through Q team's, you know, scenarios? Well, actually, and I know a lot of you, <laughs> I saw a lot of comments about this, how they couldn't see, I, I pointed out that there were strange shadows in Q team's, uh, gameplay, so if you actually look through their cutscenes, you may notice that there is a strange shadow throughout a few of the cutscenes that play out within their scenarios. And uh, it, some of you said you couldn't find it, but if you look at certain scenarios, like here, right here, this is Pop-Off, that's the uh, pod room right there, actually. Where, if you look right there, you can actually see a shadow. And also, he's also in some of the other cutscenes, the ones that I've noticed the most were the decontamination room, where he's probably about to get a very, very nice acidic shower. So, simply put, he actually is there. You just, due to the camera angles and the perspective that they place on it, you don't see Delta right away. And it isn't until the end of the game that all of that kind of, you know, synergizes and makes a bit of sense. That doesn't make the reveal any less, well, weird, but it does help kind of cement the fact that he was there. So let's further talk about the whole Q thing, since Delta is revealed to be Q at the end. What the hell was Sean, and why is Sean called Q throughout most of the game? Well, the simple fact is, throughout most of the game, Sean is not actually called Q. In fact, they gloss over that, and they tiptoe around the fact that, well, he's never actually called Q in the game. In fact, the only one, I, I, let's see, the only time I can actually think about the fact that he was called Q was in the intro cinematic where they played the credits. And that is where they introduced all the characters and they only refer to him as Q there. In fact, never once in the actual game, i.e. characters and story, do they actually refer to the child as, well, Q. Instead, they just simply call him the child or the kid, which kind of furthers the point that in the game, Q is kind of an unknown entity. In fact, they never really touch that. In game, there's a status menu. And when you look at the status menu, I never actually touched this in the Let's Play because I, <laughs> admittedly, I wasn't really focusing on that. But if you pull it up and look at all their status, it's, it's kind of odd because the only character who doesn't really have a portrait is Q. We'll get back to this one in a bit, but we'll further along this whole uh, thought process with the next little segment. 
So Sean isn't Q, but what about all these choice moments in the game where you have to play the decision game and kind of select and pull out certain characters? Mostly, these involve shooting each other, at least in Q-team situations. The first I can think of is Eric and his shotgun after Mira is found killed in a pod. And when you follow this line, you have the option to input a name. And <laughs> admittedly, there are a lot of names you can put in that will get interactions from Eric, which is really cool when you think about it. Like if you put in Gab, he'll react and say, how can a dog kill Mira and things like that. But the most interesting is if you put in Q. If you put in Q, Eric reacts like this. Well, that's clearly impossible. Which honestly, looking back at it, actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Mostly because Q, or Delta, ah, uh, throughout most of this, is pretending to be a blind and deaf man, and how can a blind and deaf man murder, let alone strangle someone to death? And this is further extrapolated in how, if you put in Sean, you also get this little bit. I see. I knew it was you. So let's go a bit further into this, mostly in another decision game. The three-way standoff between Sean, Eric, and Mira. In this one, you get to put in another name. And if you put in me or myself, you actually get an error back that says, you cannot kill yourself. Obviously, you can't shoot yourself with an arrow, that would just be bad, right? Well, if you put in Q, you get an error that says you have to specify the nit real real, and it says real, real name of the person you want to shoot, which obviously foreshadows a lot there, but there's more to the standoff than there should be. If you decide to shoot Mira, Eric takes the crossbow bolt for her, and she gets angry, naturally, because not only did you kill Eric, but you also destroyed his heart, and well, she has other reasons to be upset about that one, but... After that, she shoots you, but she she shoots twice in an odd little, I guess. I mean, she could possibly be shooting you twice, but the other option is that she shot Sean, and then she shot Q, which is very strange when you think about it, and when you look back at that situation, you realize that there's a little bit more to the whole thing. Add to the fact that, well, the fragment that you play that at uh, is simply titled Triangle, and Triangle is actually the symbol in the Greek alphabet for Delta, furthering along the fact that Delta exists, and of course later on you can come back and put in his name and shoot him. Fun stuff. And of course there's always characters mentioning not only an old man, but somewhat weirdly mentioning that Q has a handicap and that he, he didn't even see something coming, or that he's too old. And it seems really odd, considering that, at that point, the only Q you know is Sean. But there's one cutscene that I really remember, and that is, I believe, right after you choose not to inject yourself with Radical Six. And that is where Eric seems to be, at least, you're thinking about it, he's talking to Gab, because Gab is already kind of s seen as an old dog. And he refers to Gab as an old man, kind of leans down, and for the most part you're thinking he's talking to Gab, but upon, you know, this whole revelation that Q or Delta exists in the game, you realize that this situation actually takes on a new light, and in fact that probably, at least, in this light, uh, he wasn't actually talking to Gab, and instead was simply talking to Q. What do you think, old man? C-Team's gotta be alive, right? What are you doing, Eric? He's not gonna answer you. Hey, you don't know. Maybe he... Can speak? But let's talk about probably the most interesting Easter egg and trivia that I can think about within the game itself outside of maybe anagrams <laughs> and that is the status screen and the status screen just simply does what it says it displays the status of every person in the game all the teams 
and their status is either alive, well, or dead. And within the fragment where Diana and Sigma are trapped underneath in the bunker, after Akane has escaped through the X door, and well, you know, they're they're stuck there. They they really can't do much. And if you check the status screen, it of course displays everything. Everyone's dead except Diana, Sigma, and of course Akane, who escaped. And if you pay attention though, once Diana finds out that she's pregnant, and eventually she gives birth to two babies. One Phi and one Delta. And during that portion, if you actually look at the status screen, two characters have miraculously come back to life. Those being both Phi and Q. Further hinting at the fact that Delta is in the game, and he himself is Q. And that is the craziest thing I can think of when it comes to trivia and easter eggs, is the fact that the status screen itself is used as a part of the game to kind of give you a hint. And if you're actually a little bit, you know, looking as closely as you can, you might spot just a glimmer of the fact that there is a 10th participant. And that's just insane to me. But we have one last thing to talk about when it comes to Delta. But let's talk about that one last thing, and that is... Anagrams. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Anagrams, so beautiful. The, those things written on the walls, just to confuse you. You have no idea what they mean, but somehow our characters manage to create phrases out of them to further along the plot. And, well, it's no... No surprise that Delta himself loves them, or it seems to at least admire the fact that he can do that. Right next to Latin, of course. He loves Latin as well, for some odd reason. But either way, there is one more anagram in the game, or at least one more anagram of the game, that isn't quite seen. And that is, well, in the title. Zero Time Dilemma. All the letters in that can actually be used to create another phrase. And that phrase simply is, Me? I'm Zero. I'm Delta. Further, <laughs> furthering along the point that Delta does, in fact, exist in the game. And even to this point, he's mind hacking you right now. God damn it, are you serious? But that's really all there has to deal with when it comes to Easter eggs outside of Delta. We've already gone over a few of the Easter eggs in the Let's Play such as the uh, Funi Rimpa, whatever it is, with Junpei, and of course the Cat Tick with uh, Sigma. So, there is one more thing that I do want to talk about when it comes to Zero Time Dilemma, and 999, and VLR. Granted, we won't be going too deep into those two, because they're standalone games. You should probably go try them out. They're coming to Steam and stuff. But, <laughs> enough advertisement. Let's get into the sad story of Snails and Zero. So throughout most of the game, Zero tells you the story of several things. Most of them are small, little sad stories about how life just simply isn't fair. But what people seem to not realize throughout most of this game is that these stories actually have, well, a tie to a lot of the characters within the game. From the snail that somehow causes a traffic accident, killing a very famous surgeon, to a woman simply changing her jogging path and dying a terrible, terrible death. But all of these are very, very important to the crucial story of Zero Time Dilemma. And let's just, let's take a small little look at these stories and how they directly reflect what happens within the game. So let's talk about that woman who went jogging and unfortunately changed her path because of a solitary snail and with it changed her life probably not for it well the better because unfortunately that woman is heavily implied to be eric's mother and on her path that she just decided to change she unfortunately runs into a very young girl who's questioning a lot of things when it comes to emotions and not understanding how people can be happy or sad or anything in between and unfortunately, she ends up killing Eric's mother and ripping out her heart 
to try and feel warm. <sighs> and with that, three things happen. The first of which is that that young little child who committed this heinous act was Mira, of course. And from this came, well, an obsession of sorts to experience these expressions, this warmth, this emotion that Mira could not grasp. And from it, a serial killer was born. The Heart Ripper. Meanwhile, the police would eventually find the body. And, well, they would suspect a male committed this crime. And it wouldn't take long for them to find a suspect. And unfortunately, the suspect's last name was Kurashiki. Which just so happens to be the last name of one Akane Kurashiki and her brother Aoi Kurashiki. Their father was found guilty of crimes that he never committed. And with it, he was sentenced to death. And adversely, their mother could not take it. And she eventually took her own life. This left the two alone, and eventually Aoi took over as the guardian for Akane. And eventually they moved away, but moving led them to a situation where they would eventually be kidnapped and forced to take place in a game that would change their lives forever. And thus the events of 999 began. And to think, all because of one little girl and one woman jogging a different path. It's hard to imagine. Unfortunately for Eric, well, after his mother's death, his father didn't take too well to that. He became abusive and alcoholic, continuously beat him and his brother Chris, until eventually, well, one beating went too far and, well, Chris did not survive. And Eric was forced to do something drastic. His brother's body was disposed of in a freezing, watery grave. And Eric himself probably will never recover from this emotional trauma. He lost a brother, forced to smile, and all of it from, well, a simple change in path. A simple choice resulted in so much sorrow. But there's one more story, and kind of relates. You see that snail, that, that very same snail that crossed that woman's pathway and led her down a different trail. Well, it also so happened to cause a car accident. And you see that Japanese businessman, the father of two, convicted of murder? That for all reasons, he did not commit. Well, on that very same day, he called a taxi cab. But, well, obviously... He didn't get that. The cab that he would have taken was instead taken by a surgeon. And that surgeon himself would go on to die in that cab in a traffic accident on his way to the hospital to perform a life-saving surgery on a young boy. Unfortunately, well, that boy has no hope now. And while in the hospital, as he slowly withered away, he met an old man. And that old man became his only friend. And while they traded information, he traded books and got to learn a lot. Unfortunately, the boy withered day by day. And while it's not explicitly stated, Zero, of course, would be that old man. Delta would meet the real Sean in that hospital. And from there, he learned perhaps maybe Sean himself was a shifter who could in some way, trade places with an alternate history of himself. But instead, Sean decided not to do that, not to force another consciousness to slowly die like he will, and instead accepted his fate, and withered and died. And with that was left Delta. Delta himself obviously felt a connection to that little boy. So much so that, years later, he would go on to make a robot modeled directly after that boy he met in that hospital and watched slowly die. So, what's this concept for a snail? Why is a snail so important to the story that Zero's trying to tell us? This, these weird moments that he just kind of conveys 
telling us life isn't fair, well, it's because it's a lot like a butterfly effect. The smallest things can lead to the biggest ramifications. The snail caused a woman to change her path and end up murdered. That murder led to so much sorrow and misery that would eventually could even lead to the loss of billions of lives. The snail led to a car crash that cost a boy his life. The concept here is simple. The smallest tragedies create the biggest disasters. And with it, that poses another question. And this one is for those who saw the ending. And I have to ask you, would you shoot Delta? Knowing that something as small as a snail could affect the future. Would sparing him alter anything at all? Would killing him change much? Well, it can't be seen right now, but eventually something in the future will change from that event, from that time, and well, that's the dilemma. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey everyone! So, uh, this is the last portion of the bonus video, and in this portion, I'm gonna go through the files, the, the epilogue files, and I'll read them out to you, and we'll see, and we'll discuss a little bit what happens. And honestly, let's go through it, shall we? Okay, so we have a lot of stuff to go through. Well, there's the Monty Hall problem, which would have told me. You think there's no way to know which was right, but the chance is one, two, and one. This ain't the same. The question will be answered. The game, the gas mask location, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, um, a parasite that that used snails as initial husk. Uh, transfer the yeah. So, uh, okay, we want. I believe the other Phi. We'll start off with the other Phi. Baby Phi was indeed transported from uh, from one of uh. 1904 to 2008, but a remained in 1904. Whatever happened to that Phi? Rumor is she became a brilliant scientist and worked at a research facility in the U.S. well into her hundreds. The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where Phi from 1904 is sent. Hmm. So are you trying to tell me that Phi, Phi's, uh, Phi's ad adoptive parent is Phi herself, and she was named after Phi? Oh my god. Seventeen years ago, a young mother went jogging in the park. She reached a fork where she usually doesn't, eh, where she usually goes right, but on this day, she decided to go left. Why? Because there was a snail on the path. No one knows why she avoided a snail. Was she, was she afraid of them? Or she felt a sense of danger from it? Whatever the case may be, the snail caused her to switch to the left path. As a result, she was killed by a girl. The suspect was taken into custody, a Japanese man. It was, uh, was not the culprit. He was falsely convicted and executed, and his wife committed suicide in her grief. The two chil young children left behind. The convicted man called a, ca a taxi but before his arrest, but the taxi ended up picking another fare instead, a brilliant surgeon. However, the, the car became involved in an accident, killing the surgeon. See, all caused by a snail. Ah, <sighs> good lord. I actually, I don't think that was actually specified, so my, my initial thing was a little bit off on that one, but, uh, oh well. <laughs> this fate must be, uh, this must be fate. Fate! Diana smiled weakly from, be uh, from the bed at Sigma's question. Do, don't you remember? You told me that yourself. Me? I never said it. It was, it, if it was, really was me, then, yes, the Sigma who was... 67 inside, Diana shifts her frail hand over to Sigma, and she gently grasps it between her own. The Sigma before her is not the one trapped in the shelter. It's the same body, 
but a different consciousness. On April 13th, 2029, Sigma that was at the headquarters of Crash Keys, his eyes and arms replaced with robotic ones. There, the young Sigma returned to his body from 45 years in the future and begins to carry out Akane's instructions. How many years has it been since you came here, Diana? A little over three, I think. I followed here. Uh, I followed you here to uh, 2029. Uh, oh, a violent coughing fit takes takes over after uh, she speaks. Sigma helps her sit up and softly pats her on her back until it subsides. Don't you? Don't you? Uh, why didn't the medical pod work? I told you, it's fate. Diana's skin is deathly pale, but her eyes still shine with life, just as just like a child's. Ooh. I've always dreamt of coming here. Did you know that Diana is the name of the goddess of the moon? I wanted to do this ever since I was little. I'm so I'm perfectly fine with dying here. What are you saying? I've been able to spend the last three years living with you, Sigma. I have treasured every moment. Sigma lowers his head, his expression pained. Please don't make this fa that face. You don't need to be sad. In the year 2074, you will shift back to Christmas 2028. And the next day, old me will head to decom facility in Nevada Desert and meet you. Diana nods. Sigma closes his eyes and shakes his head. That's not it. I mean, I'm in love with you. His his declaration stops as Diana uh, uh, Diana's lips close over his uh, in a kiss, and the rest of the world is uh, rest of the words are lost. Come on, scroll down correctly. Ah! At that moment, uh, Diana murmurs, "It must be wonderful future, the future where we found each other in 2028." Sigma holds on to her tightly, aching heartfelt sobs echo within a cold, silent world. Okay, so these are all the stories after these uh, certain moments. Post pay uh, payoff. The day is bright and clear. A girl in a white dress strolls along the beach, the wind tossing at her, her long blonde hair playfully. Up until half a year ago, she had been confined to a bed. Carlos's eyes still tear up every time she, he sees her smile. Come on, Carlos. Don't all <laughs> you don't always have to help me. That's the point of my rehab. You're right. Sorry, Maria. Carlos brushes her hair out of her face. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely not Summer Sun that's making him act out of sorts. It's the fact that his sister is here standing before him. Maria grins at him. What would Akane and Junpei say if they saw you being all fussy like this? It's fine. They understand how important you are to me. Both you and Junpei put their uh, put your lives on the line. That was a different history, but going through this that means we know how to treat uh, reverie syndrome. I can't believe we have the ability to jump through space time. I'm just glad you're able to control it now. It's all because Carlos met Akane and Junpei that Maria was able to recover. He wishes he could show them just how well she's doing. You're thinking about them right now, aren't you, Carlos? That makes you, what makes you say that? Because you're smiling. Carlos closes his eyes and uh, as his unconscious smile turns fond. They're just about your age. It kind of feels like I'm gained a brother and another sister. You are going to their wedding, aren't you? Yeah, and you're coming with me. But there's something Carlos needs to do first. Back when the three of them parted ways. I'll be waiting to hear from <laughs> hear a word from you when uh, you locate the terrorists. Uh, Carlos he uh, held his right hand out towards Akane and Junpei, and the others grabbed onto it their own. There was no way of knowing if Delta was telling the truth, but if he was, oh my god, one fanatic would kill off all of humanity. Akane and Junpei vowed to find this person, and Carlos offered to help. He can still feel the strong bond between the three of them, their hands clasped together tightly. I suppose I better get used to talking more before the wedding, huh? Holding her hair out to, holding her hair out of her face, Maria reaches out to her brother, who takes her hand in this in his, and they continue walking down the beach. The same blue sky above them stretches over, uh, <laughs> stretches over friends Carlos knew, knows he can rely mm. on. Yep. Junpei sits on a white sofa, somewhere within the secret location of Crash Keys, twiddling a pin and sighing. <sighs> what else should I say? Laying on the table in front of him is a half-written letter. Suddenly, Akane, uh, Akane pops behind him. 
<laughs> what are you doing, Jupei? She playfully teases. Ah! He dies for the letter, and she snatches it from his fingers uh, and begins reading. Let's see. Carlos, without you, Akane and I wouldn't have gotten together. Thank you. Is this an invitation to the wedding? No, it most definitely not. It's most definitely not. He makes a grab for the paper, but Akane quickly moves out of his reach. It's just a progress report. Junpei mutters, okay, yeah, I mentioned the wedding, but the date here, but the date hasn't been set yet. I made a promise to you and your brother. You wouldn't get married until we've dealt with a fanatic. Akane's face flushes bright. She hastily uh, hides her face behind the letter and goes back to reading. I'd like nothing more to get your approval and blessing of our old friend and those of you we met six months ago. Eyes wide, Akane glances at Junpei. He avoids her gaze, awkwardly stretching back, eh, stretching the back of his head. You know, there's a history where I keep searching for you, even after I'm old and craggy. It still exists somewhere. E uh, and when I think of that, a sharp pain jolts through Jun Junpei's face. Kane is pinching his cheek. Ow, that hurts! What are you doing? To prove to you that this isn't a dream, Akane giggles. You can't, you still can't believe we're together like this. Junpei shakes his head. You've changed a lot, Junpei. A half a year ago, we were never this we were never this honest. It's like how do I want to describe it? Like a dream, huh? Junpei leans leans in and quickly pinches Akane. Oh now you've done it. She darts forward and goes after Junpei with both hands, setting in a pinch whenever she can, wherever she can. And Junpei does the same. Once they start laughing, it's very hard to stop, and they keep going until they're out of breath. I guess this is all thanks to Carlos too. Ah, and that's why I'm writing that thank you letter. And I, on Akane's left hand, a ring glitters on her ring finger. Oh God. Is there a payoff for, the, oh, there's no, okay. Hey Mira, how are you feeling? Are you lonely? Come on, Eric, you visited last week. Eric smiles wryly and reaches out to Mira with his left hand. Mira does the same and their hands uh, with matching silver rings align. On the, oh god. Da 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 da, where is it? Oh god. <laughs> Jesus. The rings align on the either side of the uh, plexiglass window. I bought a new uh, brought a new guest uh, to see you today, Eric Schiff, to the side, and a head pops into view. You're, hi Amir, a long time no see. <laughs> it's Sean, right? Yep, I'm happy you remembered. Behind Mira, the sun is shining through an iron-barred window, lighting up the visitor room. It's been a long time, Sean. It's good to see you. The smile that appears on her face is real. Mira is no longer uh, no longer needs to plaster on a fake one. When I heard you turned yourself in, I was really surprised. Eric's the one who convinced me. He said I should pay for my sins so we could be together. So that's why you got married in jail? Eric ducks his head shyly. Are you sure that's you're okay with this? Mira asks. He looks at her in confusion. Don't you regret marrying me? I don't. I didn't. I did carve your heart out in another history. Isn't that what you said, Sean? Yeah, you did. Eric looks at Mira straight in the eye. I've already. Good lord, I've already told you. This is a. <laughs> this a bunch of times. I forgive you, no matter what happens. Besides, you haven't killed me in this history, right? Yet. Lip. Listen. <laughs> yet. Mira's lips tip twist wryly. But the Heart Rippers killed people already. So many. Sean, stop it. Eric turns angrily to Sean, and Mira's face falls into a frown, but Sean continues speaking. You turned yourself in, Mira. But you, uh, but that doesn't mean you, uh, you paid for all of the crimes you did. I doubt families and friends that were left behind would forgive you even if you were put on death row. There's no way you can clear your sins here. Mira grits her teeth. But there is a way to clear them. Well, not that you've all... <laughs> not from what... Not, not what you've already done. Technically, you'll have to pay for what uh, for those uh, for those your whole your whole life that you never change. But maybe you can in another universe. Ooh. Suddenly, Sean's fist crashes through a plexic the a plexiglass window. Ah! Mira jumps backwards while Eric is frozen in shock. What are you? Eric can't even finish speaking before Sean moves, jumping through the broken window. He kicks the uh, the outside wall of the visitor room, causing it to crumble and reveal a giant hole. An alarm immediately starts blaring, and police officers rush into the room. But Sean darts through the uh, uh, darts forward and takes all them all down in the blink of an eye. 
He holds out a mir uh, hand to Mira. Let's go. Go where? I know where the transporter is being stored. You're, you're saying we should go change history? Eric finally stutters. Sean nods. To stop young Mira from committing murder, Mira. I'm pretty sure that's the only way you can clear your sins. Mira stares out through the hole of the wall on the horizon extending beyond. Is that is that all? Where Where's uh I mean we have the other five, but Oh, I'm kind of sad. They don't have I mean they have a Kane, Carlos and that, but the only thing we got for for uh Diana and and Sigma is the post apocalypse thing. Good lord, that kind of sucks. Oh well, well, that's the end, guys. And, you know, well, <laughs> it's quite odd, but still, nonetheless, I hope you guys enjoyed. That's that's pretty much the epilogue stuff. At least uh, Kane and Junpei seem to be doing well, and so is Carlos. Not so sure Mira should be getting a happy ending, but oh well. For now, though, guys, I will catch you later. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the bonus video. Hope you enjoyed. Hope it was worth the effort I put into this. I will catch you all later.